uh, I just want to first introduce myself, introduce Alex over here. My name is Caleb Weaver. I work for Borderlands Restoration Network. We're a nonprofit based out of Patagonia, Arizona. And this is part of a workshop series that we're doing in collaboration with a bunch of organizations, including Waterwise, who Alex over here is representing. Um, but also, it's, uh, it's half based in Patagonia and half based in Wachuca City. So in Patagonia, we're working with the Youth Enrichment Center there in Patagonia. Uh, this is all being funded by the um, Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS. Of course, we're collaborating with the Wachuca City Community Garden, who is here in droves today. And uh, with Oasis Rainwater Harvesting, who will be here for the uh, cisterns work workshop that we do in two weeks here in this, in this place as well. We're gonna spend an hour and a half in here talking, theoretically, about rain, rain gardens. And then after that, we're gonna go look at some. So um, what I like to do is just have uh, open dialogue. So if you've got questions, raise your hand. If I don't see your hand, give a shout and we'll talk things through. Um, and then afterwards, what we can do is, is go look at the cisterns that were built um, as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to begin um, with this presentation. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex Godmeyer. I'm with the Waterwise. I'm with the youth program. Um, I'm being a community side person today to um, to help Caleb with this presentation because um, I do think that water harvesting is fantastic, and um, I think we're ready to talk about rain gardens. Let's get started. Okay. So, why do we harvest rainwater? So. Usually when we see red and orange and like yellow on the map, it's not good. And um, we can confirm that it's not actually, that it's not really very good in this map. So this is showing, that unfortunately the, the video points are a little difficult to see, but um, yellow stands for normally dry. Um, the light orange is moderate drought. The dark orange is severe drought. And then it goes extreme drought and exceptional drought. And it doesn't appear to be, there are no areas in Arizona where there's not drought. Um, in Cochise County, um, we're still in moderate drought, except for this, um, let's see, no, that's, sorry, that's the dark orange, so it's in severe drought. So even though we had a really great monsoon last season, a good monsoon does not uh, drought negate. So, um, let's see, let's see. I think this is, uh, was this the just one year? Um, yeah, this is the short-term drought on the top, and this is the long-term drought mm -hmm. on the bottom right. Right, so it's a similar kind of um, trajectory in terms of the colors, and you can see that um, Cochise County is, um, is in various shades of, um, of drought, specifically extreme drought. And so um, we are not going to be getting a whole, or we haven't been getting a lot of water and that has been kind of twofold as far as like some people um because I, I manage social media and i will i will post something about um, water harvesting and someone will be like well you can't harvest rainwater if there's no rain and i'm like yes but you also can't harvest rainwater if you don't plan for when it rains because it will rain and as we noticed this past year it can often rain a lot and so it's important for us to be for the eventuality of rain, and especially in terms of climate change intensifying storms, um, we want to make sure that we're considering larger amounts of rainfall. Okay, and I'll probably be saying things that are on other slides. Bear with me. Um, let's see. So the picture that we have it's a little um, it's a little hard to see, or at least as, as far as what it's depicting, but. In the, um, this is of the Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a picture in Tucson, and believe it or not, there used to be surface water in um, in Tucson. This was as recently as probably a century ago. Yeah, about a hundred years. Yeah, um, and human activities in the area has effectively wiped out all of the surface um, the surface water. And um, something that some people don't really realize is that. Even if we're not literally, you know, putting a hose into the, the surface water, even if so, if we're taking the water from underground, it is still connected to the surface water. Um, but ultimately, this has been it hasn't been due to anything essentially but human activity. And so we have a responsibility, in my opinion, to um, address that 
and this is a small way that we can do that. Um, so as I was mentioning, it's like, <laughs> so I work with, with kids, and I'm usually like, okay, where does, where, tell me where your water comes from. And they're like, Walmart, the sewer. <laughs> and so I usually blow their mind when it turns out that, especially in our area, we are reliant almost exclusively on rainwater. I'm sorry, not rainwater, groundwater, groundwater, underground. Although we are also reliant on, on rainwater if we choose to. Um, so all of the water that we use for everything in our lives, um, landscaping, mm -hmm. uh, drinking, washing, etc., comes from underground. And this water accumulated over a period of thousands, millions of years. Um, it can be referred to, or some people refer to it as dinosaur water because some of it has been dated to be thousands and thousands of years old. So we're taking it out at a rate that is much faster than it can possibly be replenished naturally. Um, there's a statistic in um, one of the the document or one of the publications on the WaterWise website that suggests that only about two to three percent of the precipitation that we get actually reaches groundwater recharge. So the rest of that it evaporates, it runs off, it flows away. So, um, in turn, so it's really difficult a to know how much groundwater there is, and b to um, know whether or not we're recharging it. So let's see. So the more groundwater that we use, the more surface water disappears, and especially in our area, um, the San Pedro River and all of the all of the wildlife and tourism that comes as a result of that being the last free-flowing river, the birding community, um, we rely on there being some surface water as well. In addition, of course, we want to have groundwater, but um, animals can't exactly dig underground thousands and thousands of feet to get more groundwater like we do. Okay, so the next one. As I mentioned, uh, climate change means that um, things are, are likely to be more unpredictable. So even though um, it's not that there won't be as much rain, it's whenever rain comes, it's more intense because there's more heat to allow more vapor to be held in the atmosphere. Um, as we can, so this picture, um, there's actually a, um, there's a tool, an online tool that kind of shows where the, um, where your climate in a particular area is headed. And having known, um, like my dad was Kuwait, you do not want that. Although to be fair, I also don't want Phoenix right now. <laughs> Regardless of the trajectory, it would have to go down like 15 degrees for me to be like, yeah, Phoenix. Okay, um, let's see. And so, yes, as, as you said, so it, it, I think it overall is drier because the, it's kind of, in my opinion, it seems like it's kind of no man's land as far as it's difficult to predict what is going to be happening next um, in terms of um, like exactly what's going to happen, but ultimately drier or violent storms. Okay, let's see. Another reason to harvest rainwater is to prevent flooding. Um, I'm sure that you've experienced flooding on your property before, particularly last monsoon season. Yeah, so knowing that this is going to occur um, especially if you have a lot of impermeable surfaces, um, a big roof area, um, lots of maybe like sidewalk areas where water can't sink into the ground, um, you want to really take advantage of the areas where the water, where you can in fact sink some water into the ground and store it in the soil. Um, and the, and of course, the side effect of that is that rather than the water just accumulating, it's sinking into the ground and being used for something. Okay, so getting back to um, what I was talking about, the connection between groundwater and surface water. Um, from my understanding, one of the biggest things that we can do to help um, sustain our groundwater levels for a longer period of time is to figure out how can we take out less groundwater. And as you can see here, uh, I mean, this will of course depend on the area and the, the particular climate so on and so forth, but um, a very large percentage of the average user's water is used outside. And seeing that rain also happens outside, 
Um, if we are able to um, craft our ground in such a way and craft our planting in such a way that the water that naturally happens um, goes to the right place, then that results ultimately in less water use. Many of these sources are also ways that you can use gray water. So you could potentially harvest the, the 9% that's from cold water. Um, some people are able to harvest some water from their showers. Um, and some of you are able to take it from their, from their bath. Um, yes. Yeah, um, so we, while we can't reclaim toilet water, any, any ideas how we can use less water, you know, in a toilet setting? Composting. composting toilets. If you're using composting toilets, how much of that 11% are we using on our, to flush waste down the toilet? Zero. Zero. Maybe a little bit to like wet down the, your paper or whatnot. You can use gray water for that. Can you use gray water for that? Oh boy. So um, another thing to, to think about is, um, especially compared to some places like Phoenix, we actually get a decent amount of rain on average. I mean, it's, it's still air desert, but um, if you're really smart with whatever catchment area that you have in terms of a roof, um, and you're able to direct that water purposefully, um, as you can kind of see in this picture, um, and being able to use the water multiple times, which is something that you could do through active rainwater harvesting. Today's, um, today we'll be talking more about passive rainwater harvesting, which is when the water is stored in the ground, as opposed to active rainwater harvesting, which is when it's stored in the tank. Speaking of active versus passive, which of these is active? <laughs> the quiz time. <laughs> So we got, well, I'll go ahead and go through it. I, I realized it might be a little too. So we got French drain. So we got um, the rain falling on the roof and goes through your gutter, and there's a French drain. So that would be passive, right? Um, pavers, which um, kind of make it so that you can, so that it's a, a slightly permeable surface. Um, you can have the rain go through the cracks, so that's passive. Um, gutter system plus a tank would be yeah. active, right? And then bulge, bulge. That's that's gonna be combined with B with the mulch. <laughs> so mulch basins, um, those would be passive. Berms, also passive. So those are just big bumps in the ground to um, to keep water contained in one place. Gagnon wall, which is uh, rocks surrounded by wire, that would also be passive, right? Um, yeah, essentially the rest of these are passive except for um in a system, exactly. And so anything that has to do with shaping the ground to ensure starting from the high points in your, in your watershed and figuring out the best way to focus the water where you want it to go to focus it to plantings and away from areas you don't want it, that's passive rainwater harvesting. And um, we'll be talking more about the specifics of that in this presentation. Something I love about this slide is when folks oftentimes think about rainwater harvesting, what do you think of first and foremost? Cisterns. And look at this. How many of these are cisterns? Only one out of nine. So that means eight out of nine of the ways that we can harvest rainwater have nothing to do with cisterns and have everything to do with how we shape the earth. So that's, that's the big takeaway that I get from this is Rainwater harvesting is so much more than just a cistern. Especially given that there are so many um, catchment services, like um, you see that there's a road here, and um, it always it pains me, it it hurts me when I see um, areas that are paved and they have a, a curb, and then there's a lower point next to it. I'm like, just cut the curb so that the water can be free into the into the soil. Um, so. I appreciate that in many places in Tucson, for example, that's more of a standard practice, the, the, green, um, the green infrastructure to ensure that the water that's coming off of impermeable surfaces actually goes just into the soil. All right. And um, so obviously we talked about active rainwater harvesting, but even with active rainwater harvesting, if you had um, a particular capacity tank for the past um, the past monsoon season, there's a good chance that it probably wasn't enough capacity for how much rain you got. So 
Um, even with an active um, harvesting system, you need some sort of passive plan, or it's not a passive plan, it's an active plan for passive rainwater harvesting for the overflow. So, um, and that's a really, I, know, I think it's really cool to, to just be thinking ahead about how can we, how can we use this water productively um, and regeneratively. So as you kind of alluded to, there are many different um, sources of rainwater. The probably the most common for us would be like our roofs of our houses. Um, but there's also sidewalk, even certain kinds of landscape, if they're really um, compacted and don't, um, don't absorb a lot of water, if it's not very spongy, then water will just run off over it. And depending on where it flows to, that can be something that you can use shower and laundry and sinks as being potential sources of gray water. So which of these do you think, of the ones that are starvish, do you think probably produces the most water? So I think on a regular basis, it's actually shower. Yeah. So I would imagine that laundry would come in, in second. Um, although I guess it depends on how often you, you wash your clothes and, and how big of a family you've got. So I know that we definitely use a lot of water through laundry. Okay. So with showers, how can we harvest rainwater? So let's say that we live in a house where the uh, shower is, is hooked into concrete and we just can't access it to harvest that rainwater. How can we still harvest rainwater uh, with a shower uh, in that kind of a situation? Rainwater or dishwater? We stick a oh, bucket under our tap and we harvest everything that flows until it's to the temperature. So it's tough gas. You can also These are great. These are two great solutions. Both of those are great solutions. I do the bucket method at my house. I stand in a bucket and I shower and then I like go and flush my toilets with the bucket afterwards. So that's, that's what I do at my house um, where I rent. Um, but of course you could do an outdoor shower. Here in Arizona, it's a perfect place to do an outdoor shower because what, nine months of the year you could be outside without it being too cold to have an outdoor shower. So it's a place where you can put the shower in the right spot and then water passively moves to you know, water a vine that's covering the shower so you don't have to, um, you've got a little privacy there or something like that. So there's there's cool stuff you can still do with, with shower water too. And so of course for passive rainwater harvesting, um, any kind of low or any kind of impermeable surface like a driveway or a road or like your neighbor's shed or um, yeah, any, any hard surface that does not absorb the water and the water flows onto your property, that's an, uh, an opportunity to uh, use passive rainwater harvesting. Uh, and I just mentioned that already, but it's still cool. <laughs> so uh, and then I'll probably hand this over to Caleb. So what exactly is a rain garden? Thank you, Alex. Yes. Um, okay, so can someone help me out with what a rain garden is? Any ideas out here what a rain garden is before we start to define it? Great, this is great. So what we'll do is we're going to define it. Um, a rain garden, it's basically a sunken rainwater harvesting basin that naturally collects and stores water in the ground. So where's the water coming from that's going into this basin here? It's coming off the street. So where you've got to think about, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. Yep, so it's coming off the street and into this, this basin right here, okay. So throughout this presentation, we're gonna show you a lot of ideas of what rain gardens can look like because honestly, they can look like a lot of different things. So basically, if we've got a spot where there's standing water and we're smart about it and we create a little rain garden there, instead of being this hazardous area where mosquitoes are, you know, uh, breeding and uh, where it gets all muddy and no one wants to hang out, you can really easily turn it into something like this just by shaping the earth a little bit. So this is what a rain garden can look like here. So how does a rain garden work? In a very typical setting, as Alex was talking about, what you want to do is you want to use water from maybe the roof of your house or some other catchment area, a place where water naturally collects, and then direct that water into a given location uh, where you have the plants located. 
So that's basically the, the gist of what we're looking for with the rain garden right here. I'm going to talk about why we like to use native plants in a rain garden, because that's what I usually try to do. I try to use native plants. That's, that's my big goal. However, there's a spot at the community garden where I'm going to try to convince Anne to put some food plants in, because there are situations where that's something you can do too. So what is good about a rain garden? Well, there's a lot of things, and um, I just really wanted to briefly give a little shout out to uh, Brad Lancaster's books which are available at harvestingrainwater.com, where also I stole most of these images from. Um, his books are great. If you want to like get a little introduction, start with the blue one, volume one, because it's just an introduction. If you want to do a deep dive, get the green one, volume two, because that's all about what we're talking about today, that book right there. So what I love about rain gardens um, is you can really work with the different types of plants. So if you calculate your rain garden, and I'll talk about how to do all these calculations. If you do a nice calculation and you figure out that the um, water from the catchment area is going to fill up this one right here, well, then next to the bottom area where you've got higher water tolerant plants, you can then put different plants because, you know, this shrub right here, it's going to put its roots over here into the rain garden too. And then you can also play with plants that use a little bit less water too. So those are some of the things that I like to do with a, with a rain garden. But what is really good about a rain garden? Let's, let's talk about all the different things. First and foremost, it replenishes groundwater. It filters water. It reduces flooding. We talked about flooding being a big hazard around here as well. It, of course, supports plant life, which, of course, then support wildlife. It sequesters carbon. It grows food. It reduces the urban heat island effect. Does anyone, can anyone give a little uh, synopsis of what the urban heat island effect is here? It's going to be buildings and pavement that create heat. Exactly. So if you've got a nice tree that's kind of shading an area, will that pavement heat up? No. Not so much. So if we've got a bunch of trees right next to where there's pavement that usually heats up, it's going to keep things cooler. So at nighttime, it stays cooler at nighttime too. This in Tucson is actually a big issue and it's raised the temperature in Tucson quite a bit. Probably not in Wachuca City, 1,700 people, probably not a big issue here. But in a big city, that's, that's actually an issue. Sierra Vista, Vista too. Yeah. You of course can save money on your water and food bills as well. And it's low maintenance. And then also on top of that, remember that graph where it's a little bit more than half of the water that's used in the typical American houses outdoors? You can then cut in half the amount of water that you use as well. Okay, so how do you do a rain garden? Well, the first thing you've got to do is identify the catchment area. So in this very simple drawing, the catchment area is the roof of, the, of this building right here. So forget the rest of this stuff because we're talking about rain gardens. Uh, not cisterns, but the catchment area is where the water is coming from that you're directing to your rain garden. That's the first thing. Uh, the next thing you've got to do is locate the path that that water takes. So where is the catchment area in this, in this image here? What's the catchment area? So we're, we're going back kind of a slide. It's the roof. Once again, we've got the rooftop is the catchment area right here, and then it goes through, I heard someone say the gutter, through this swale, swale is just kind of a low point that water is going to travel down, and then ends up here in this rain garden. So are we pumping the water in the system? No, we're using gravity. So this is a gravity-fed system because gravity is so free. It's easy. It's the best thing to use. So uh, don't, don't try to get too complicated. Just use gravity uh, in the system here. So as you locate a rain garden, what you then need to find is a nice suitable location for water to infiltrate. So what is a suitable location? Let's talk about that. A suitable location for a rain garden is a relatively flat area uh, where water naturally pools. Remember that image where we had the, the pooling water and then the rain garden next to each other? We have already know where we want to put that rain garden because that's where the water's pooling. We want to stay away from septic systems and buried utilities. We don't want water sitting over our electric lines. It's not something you want to deal with. 
We want to keep it 10 feet away from the foundation of a building. Why do you guys think that is? Why do we want to keep it away from the building? Yeah, it's going to damage the building. We don't want water pooling near our building. We also want to consider wildlife. So does everyone know what a javelina is here? Does anyone not know what a javelina is here? Okay, even my dad who's visiting from Connecticut knows what a javelina is. Javelina, we all know what javelina are. We don't have them there. <laughs> so javelina, they love to dig up just planted plants. They like are sitting there waiting for you to plant the plants and then they come over and then they dig them up that night. So what you want to do is think about that as you're planting as well. Put some rocks around it, big boulders, and they can't dig them up. Um, and other wildlife as well. So that's something else to think about. Maybe you need to fence it in, something like that. Beth, yeah. yeah. Could, you, could you temporarily fence it off? I mean, with a wire fence to protect them until they're established? For sure. You could totally do that. Um, there's other things that folks do. If you're going to plant like a tree, sometimes people put plant like a hardware cloth, which is kind of like a wire. It's a wire mesh. A quarter inch wire mesh. That's a great thing to put right on the ground with a little hole where the tree pops up. And then they can't come and dig them up too. That's another way that folks do it. Because I can see them just digging them up. Rocks and all. <laughs> Keeps snakes out here. Oh, benefits, maybe, yeah, benefits of hardware cloth <laughs> right here. Um, there's also plants that you don't want to plant. So at my house, the thing that Havelina go for are my evening primrose. The evening primrose start to grow, they're about to flower, and then the javelina come and wipe them out every time. Are there other plants that people have that the ha javelina come and eat? Red yuccas. Red yuccas. Aloe vera. Aloe vera, okay. Any other ones that we maybe don't want to put in a rain garden? Okay, so. Even if they're established, if they're really hungry, like last summer during the monsoon, everything that was accessible is here. Yeah. Yep. So these are all things you want to consider about the location of a rain garden, along with some of the added benefits. Some added benefits of having a rain garden could be shade on the building, shade on a parking area if you live in Sierra Vista or, you know, an urban area, um, or an outdoor space. So if you want to find a space that's outdoors that you want to have it be a little shady, put a little rain garden have a tree grow there, and then right next to that, you can have like a little outdoor, outdoor area kind of, kind of thing. You know, of course, a visually pleasing location, then also household use. Um, if you wanted to grow food or medicine or an herb garden or laundry um, as well. Has anyone ever used uh, soap berries before? Soap berries? Has anyone used soap, soap berries or soap nuts? Okay, I'm, this is like one of my, my favorite things to talk about, so. I'm, Anne's heard me talk about this like five times already, so I apologize. Um, soap berries are these native trees that if you harvest the fruits from it, you can wash your clothes with it. Uh, it's something that uh, is also very attractive to wildlife. Um, but what I love about these is that it's really effective. I once gave, like, gifted some to my friend who lives in um, Boston, and she's like, oh, thank you, but these probably aren't going to work, so I'm going to have to use Tide like, you know, every other time. And then she's like, actually, they work really well. Um, they, they don't leave your clothes smelling bad. And unlike a lot of um, laundry, it doesn't have any sodium in it. So you can use it for gray water as well. So there's just a lot of benefits. We're going to plant some in the new wellness garden, wellness park over here in Wachuca City. So, and loofahs. Alex was just bringing up loofahs too. You could grow some loofahs and then you're, you're all set. You've got your outdoor shower right there too. You're all set. Rain garden. So... <laughs> <laughs> If you're in doubt, draw it out. So if you're trying to figure out like where things should go, it's really easy to just, it's, it's great to help collect your ideas by just drawing it on a piece of paper. To be honest, this is a great way to figure out like, okay, this is where I walk, this is where like the mail comes in, this is where the dog plays. So I don't want this in this location. So just drawing it out, and this, this is something I stole from online. This is not as nice of drawings as I do. So. Um, and this is also not good for our area, just think, something to think about for this lawn. But this is a great idea of just how to draw it out um, using colored pencils and whatnot as well. If you want an idea of what to kind of look, look for when you're drawing something out, there's um, an example of the community garden's uh, uh, rain, rain garden system in the back on a sheet of paper. So feel free to take a photo of that too. Okay, so it's math time. 
I didn't warn you about this, so I apologize. Did you say math or math? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I thought I said math, but maybe I said math. <laughs> so um, you have to pay attention because there's going to be a quiz. So if you, if you didn't bring a calculator, just pull out your smartphone. We can do the math on there. It's really simple math. Uh, but before we do, um, how big, so this is, forget this building right here. This is a building in Tucson. Once again, I stole this. I'm a thief. I stole this from Watershed Management Group. Um, and this is just something that they used for trying to figure out uh, how much water comes off of this roof. So first and foremost, can anyone actually read the number here and here? 63 17. Nice. Okay. You all, no one needs glasses. This is great. Um, this is the size of the roof. So in terms of the 17 foot, is that from looking from above or is that, you know, measuring at the slope, the 17 feet there? It's straight across. It's looking straight from above because when water is hitting a roof, it's coming straight from above. It's not coming at an angle, so it doesn't matter what the angle of the roof is. Yeah, it depends on the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, over here, there, there's a lot of angular rain. So that's, you're, it's different over at your house. We're in Pierce. We get a lot of... Sideways, sideways, right? Beth, did you have I'm just going to say it's bisected. Is that 17 on each side? Why is it bisected? Why is this uh, roof? Is it a... It's a pitched roof, exactly. So if water's coming off this side, we can do the calculation, and I'll ask you to do it in a sec. I know you're all itching to do math. Um, and then on this side, it's coming a different angle. So this is, I think, the south side. Water's going to hit on this part of the house, and then it's going to hit on this part of the house if it's a different you know, with the rain that hits this part of the roof. Our roofs are usually not this neat, so it's going to be different, different configurations if you're living in a different house. Okay, um, let's go to the next. Or I guess first and foremost, let's calculate this. What is going to be the area? Yeah, let's calculate the... Okay, no, let's go back, sorry. 63 times 17. 63 times 17, what's that number? Anyone have that number? Square foot. 1,071 square feet. Great. That's how much is going on each side. Hold on to that number because we're about to just do some more math. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so here is the, the calculation to figure out what the um, runoff is going to be on each side of that roof. You've got the catchment area, which we just calculated, which is 1,071 square feet. Then we multiply it times the peak rainfall event. I don't usually like to use this number 2.5. This is what I got out of Tucson because our peak rainfall here in Southern Arizona, in rural Southern Arizona is a little bit higher. What's the most anyone's ever gotten in a, in a single rain event? Three something. Yeah. Three inches is not it's rare. Now it's been much lower. It really has. We barely, I'm mean, at the rain log, we barely get over an inch a day. Even in the summer, we may get it several days in a row. I'm not measured that. Although, <coughs> wouldn't you consider, like, if you get it, like, over what period of time would you consider the peak rainfall? So if you got three inches three days in a row, would you consider that, the, the, would you add them together to make the peak rainfall? Or these, are, these are great questions. So the reason why we're calculating this is all about how big of a rain garden we're going to need. So if that water is going to sink into the ground, and then the next day rains another inch and it sinks into the ground, and the next day rains an inch and it sinks in the ground. How big of a catchment area do we need? Just for one inch. However, 2018, we, did, we built a bunch of structures, rain structures at T4 Ranch, halfway between Patagonia and Nogales. And just after we built those structures, 45 minutes, we got three inches of rain in 2018. They held, which was great. Um, whenever you build structures, after the first rain, you're just sitting there like crossing your fingers, your toes, your legs, everything. Um, and they held, which was great. So I like to do this for three inches of rain because I've seen it. I've seen it here. Um, I asked folks in Patagonia what they've seen, and they said three inches of rain in 2018, three inches of rain in 1992. So it's not common, but I like to be prepared for it um, because when we get that big rain, then we're not adding water to the floodwaters as well. It's all staying right where we want it. Okay. Catchment area times peak rainfall divided by 12 inches. Why are we dividing by 12 inches right here? Just who's done enough calculations and, and whatnot recently? Because you're converting it to feet, exactly. Okay, so we've got, in this situation, we've got a volume in feet 
and then we, or cubic feet, and then we multiply it times this coefficient, 7.48 gallons per cubic foot. That's how many gallons are in one cubic foot of water. And then you multiply it times a runoff coefficient. And what I like to use for a runoff coefficient off of a roof is about 0.9. Why do we use 0.9? Because about 90% of the water that hits the roof actually is gonna go through that gutter. Some of it's gonna evaporate, some of it's gonna go somewhere else, some of it's gonna get absorbed into the metal or whatever it is uh, before evaporating again. So about 90% of the water that hits the roof is actually gonna go down the gutter. All right, so what's the grand total here in gallons? Who's got it? 1802. 1802. 1802, I've got a, a, oh, for three inches or two and a half? Perfect, 1802 gallons um, per three inch peak rainfall event. Okay, that's a lot of water. 1,800 gallons is a lot of water. So the cistern, has anyone seen the cistern over at the, um, at the community garden? How big is that cistern? It's pretty big. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's big, it's like, <laughs> it's about this tall and about this wide and it holds 2,500 gallons of water. So just 2,500 gallons of water, so just a little bit smaller than that is what comes off of that roof in one peak rainfall event. So that tells you how much water we can get. All right, let's keep going to the next one. Okay, so now that we've got the volume, now we need to figure out how big of a rain garden that we're gonna create. So here's some really fancy calculations right here as well. Uh, once again, you've got to use your calculator if you want to figure this out. You take the volume that we just calculated, 1,800 gallons. We divide it by this coefficient to get back, or divide it by this, yeah, coefficient to then get back to the cubic feet. Um, and then what you do is you divide the, uh, the volume in cubic feet by an area in which you've got for the basin. So let's say that our basin, we only have a little postage stamp that's you know, 10 feet by 20 feet in our yard that we could possibly fit a rain garden. Well, that tells you what the, the area is from above. Now let's figure out how deep it needs to be because that's what we really need to figure out for this calculation here. Um, you know, for, for this one, I use the, the peak rainfall event for two and a half inches. Let's just for, let's use uh, you know, the 1800 that Kitty came up with. Instead, what's, what's the depth that we're gonna need in terms of feet? foot and a half. Okay, so now we know what the volume is. We've got the volume in terms of, uh, or we've got the area in terms of 10 feet by 20 feet, and then it needs to be about a foot and a half deep. Questions about this calculation? Is everyone just super clear about how to do this calculation? Nope. You're going to send these to us, will you? I'll send them to you. <laughs> Perfect. No, no tests, no tests. Okay, um, anyone want to have any discussion about any of that stuff, the calculation stuff? This is usually everyone's favorite part of the lecture right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the first calculation we did, that was our net runoff, Yeah. right? Was that our volumes per gallon? The volume which we calculated in gallons. We don't have to calculate in gallons, we can do it in cubic feet too. But yeah, we did it in, in gallons. That was the first calculation, right? Yeah. And then we divided by the 7.48 yeah. to get our volume yep. in cubic feet. Yes. And then we take that and we divide it by the area that we originally used. So this area here is the area of our basin. So the first area that we used was the area of the cat. Got it. So what space we have in our yard. Exactly. Or whatever. Yeah. Got it. And if you, don't, if you have unlimited space, then you can say, I only want an eight inch deep basin, and then you can calculate the- But you could have multiple basins also. You could have multiple basins too. Because you could have it fill up on one, run off to another one, and fill up that basin. See, now you're getting fancy. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do that. You can add a bunch of the volumes. You know, you can make one, you know, eight inches deep. You can make the next one a foot and a half deep. You can, you can really play around. Because like the runoff of a cistern, you do kind of the same thing. Once the runoff comes in, you would have the runoff into a basin. And Perfect. And have that basin so deep and then run off into another. Yeah. And hold on to that thought because we're going to talk about that in just a minute because that's, yeah, you've got to <laughs> keep it in there. Because we're going <laughs> to... 
Because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why that's a really important thing to do. Because the way you're thinking is actually uh, a really way, good way to think about these things. Believe it or not. So the next one we've got here is uh, passive solar design. And some of you I, I know are into permaculture, so I'm guessing that this is something that you've seen before. I'm just going to really briefly breeze through this. Um, but if we want to use less energy to cool our houses or heat our houses here too in the, in the winter time, this is the way that you might want to configure things at your house. These are trees. The trees you can see here are kind of coming around most of the side of the house, but not on the south side of the house. Um, and really briefly, I'm just going to really briefly go over this. During the equinox, the sun of course is rising due east. It comes up and it uh, sets due west. Anyone know what the angle is here for the summertime? It's about 27 degrees. So about 27 degrees north of east is where the sun's going to rise. It's going to, at noon, it's about 81 degrees, um, which is 90 degrees would be straight overhead. So 81 degrees is almost straight overhead. So it's almost straight overhead. And then it sets again here, 27 degrees north of west. So why am, I, why am I talking about this degrees north of west? Why, why are we talking about that in terms of the trees that you place around your house? Shade. OK, so if I'm going to play, plant a tree on the north part of the house, north of the east-west line, when is that going to shade the house? Afternoon of the summer, winter, both? Summertime. Just summer, because the sun's going to be when it's really hot because the sun's going to be dropping in the, in the wintertime, 27 degrees south of west. So if we plant a tree up here, it's not going to shade our house in the wintertime. It's only going to shade the house in the summertime when it's the hottest. Exactly. So what I really recommend is planting those trees on the north part of the house when possible and not on the south part of the house because it does get cold here in the wintertime and the sun is much lower in the wintertime as well. So the low angle of the sun uh, will be better encouraged to help heat up the house in that situation. If you're planting that area for food, you'll get, you'll get that wintertime extended season. Is that correct? Say that again. If, you're, if you have a food garden in that solar access zone, yeah. you'll get an extended season because that, that, that's the south side. As is opposed to, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, if you were to plant the garden over here in the wintertime when the sun's a lot lower, it'd be in shade. Yeah. So this is a great place to put your veggies. It's smart. Yep, that's the way to do it. And can we grow crops here in the wintertime? Yeah. Of course. Can we do that where I grew up in Connecticut? No. Well, it'd be hard. Yeah. I just wanted to say this is sort of my house you've got up here. Oh. And I have a patio on the south side, southeast actually. And um, I have, when the sun comes up, I have tall windows, and the roof for the covered patio is high also. Mm. And I get sun for 10 hours coming into my house. Mm. It's amazing. From the angles you're talking about, it was an accident. <laughs> in part, I said it was that penetrating. I didn't expect it. But the other benefit is I have, uh, I can raise potted plants, vegetables, mm. on my southeast facing patio all winter. Mm. And the heat from that builds up there keeps them warm at night, too. Okay, so we're doing a solar uh, passive design course at Ann's house. That's going to be the next <laughs> workshop. Um, okay, so why are we talking about this at Rain Gardens? workshop. Okay, well, if we're trying to think about shade, where do we want to have that rain garden? Well, we want to have it maybe on the west side of the house, the northwest side of the house, maybe on the north side of the house or the east side of the house to provide as much shade on the house, to feed the trees, to reduce our energy costs at our house. Cool. Okay, let's do the next one. Okay, so I stole these once again from Brad Lancaster's book. Uh, I stole it from his first book in particular, which is a really good one. So here are his eight um, principles of rainwater harvesting, which I like so much that I'm just going to go through each one of them. So begin with long, thoughtful observation, which is, you know, the very first permaculture principle, too. 
Um, what we want to do is really get a good idea of how water moves on our landscape before jumping in. Oftentimes we think about, uh, one of my old bosses used to say, um, don't just do something, stand there. Instead of, you know, don't just stand there, do something. So uh, what he would recommend doing is just stand there, watch, observe what happens on the landscape first and foremost. Next, what you want to do is start at the high point, start at the top of your watershed and work your way down. So if you live in Sierra Vista on a one acre parcel or smaller, where's that top of your watershed going to be? It's going to be the top of your house. If you live on 70 acres of, you know, hills around here, the top of your watershed might not be the top of your house. It might be that, the side of the hill. Um, so that's where you want to start is the top of your watershed. And why do we want to start at the top of our watershed before working our way down? What do you guys think? Gravity, gravity is great. If we slow down water further up, what we're gonna be able to do is take advantage of that water throughout the system instead of allowing it to move down the system, possibly a road, and then you know, try to have this big pool at the base of, the, of our system. We're gonna talk more about that as well. Start small and simple. So do we wanna start with 14 basins that hold 30,000 gallons of water? Is that where we wanna start? Yeah, if you're a soldier, then maybe. Um, <laughs> But if you're starting off at your backyard, maybe not. OK, let's go to the next one. OK, so this is what we were just talking about over here. OK, we can release the head at this point, because what's really good is actually taking that water from here and then sinking it into a bunch of different locations along the way. What's the benefit of doing this? Having it sit in one place, go to the next, sit there. So wait, it's not freezing. You're lessening the runoff? Lessening the runoff. And evaporation. Lessing evaporation. And you're putting it where you want it. You're directing it instead of it just flowing where it wants to go. Reducing erosion. Reduce, slowing the energy of it too. Is there going to be more places that we can harvest rainwater in this kind of situation than one big one down here too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine how many trees we could grow. Okay, so where are we going to put the most water loving plants in the system? Towards the top up here. Because if we get a quarter inch of rain, we're going to get water here. If we get an inch of rain, we're going to get water down here kind of a thing. So yep, the most water-loving plants are going to be up here. Great. OK, once again, this goes with what we just said as well. Always think about the overflow. OK, so in this system, water comes off the roof. Here's the catchment area. And then where does it go? It goes into the cistern here. We're going to not talk about cisterns today. That'll be the next one. But let's say it fills up. It overflows. Well, the overflow goes into this tree right here. But then this one's got an overflow too. The overflow then goes over into this space and over here. And then it goes into this space and over here, and then it goes into this one over here. So this is just what we were just looking at, that kind of arrow with circles going back and forth, back and forth. But now here's a real, real world situation here. Water comes here, goes there, goes there, there goes there, goes there. And look at all the plants you can grow if you do that type of situation. Create a living sponge. What do we mean by living sponge? Plants that yeah. So if we create a living sponge out of the earth, out of the earth, what we can then do is create the situation that holds more moisture, just like a sponge. How do we create a living sponge? What do we add to the soil to create a living mulch. sponge? Mulch. Mulch. Just go take some out of this car over here, please. <laughs> 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 Mulch, exactly. So if you're going to create a sponge here, what you want to do is add some uh, organics to the soil. And the way you add organics to the soil is by adding mulch. That's the best thing you can do. Because what, what um, mulch does is it breaks down over time. And not only does it shade the earth, but it increases the soil moisture holding capacity pretty significantly. Increasing it 1% to 2% can increase the amount of soil moisture holding capacity 5 to 10%. So a little bit goes a long way in terms of just adding a little bit of mulch as well. Uh, do more than just harvest water. OK, this is again where I like to talk about soap berries. So what you can do is harvest rainwater to grow food, support pollinators. Um, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, shade the house, drinking water, all sorts of different things that you can do with, uh, with a rain that you harvest. So in permaculture, they talk about stacking functions. They talk about having one thing do multiple things. 
So if you're going to have this tree, make sure that that tree produces food. Make sure that it's a tree that you know, native pollinators are going to like. Place that tree where you can shade the house. Try to have it do as much good as possible uh, when you're doing some kind of uh, rainwater harvesting in your, in your backyard. And then last but not least, continually reassess your, sy your system. Try to make sure that it's working, and if it's not working, fix it kind of a thing. Because I've been doing this for 12 years at this point, and I sometimes, rarely, but sometimes I still make mistakes. So of course, <laughs> you've got to go and, and fix the systems. <laughs> I always make mistakes. So um, in these situations, you just want to go back and fix the system afterwards. I think it was a repeated slide, so I just. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It's very important. Right. It's very important. <laughs> So why native plants? I'm going to talk about why we could plant native plants and why we could plant food plants in our, in our gardens. But let's just start with native plants. Well, I use native plants because they're drought adapted. Do we get drought here? Yes. Alex talked about that in the first slide. Um, so the plants, that, and they're still plants, even though we're in a drought living here, they're adapted to the, this regime here. So let's put some native plants that are adapted to this area here. Because whenever I create a system, I like to be as lazy as possible. I don't want to have to go and water those plants and give them fertilizer and all that stuff. Native plants are oftentimes deep-rooted. These kind of go hand in hand. The, um, they're low maintenance. There's fewer pests because, once again, these are part of the ecosystem. So you're not going to have you know, to deal with that uh, cabbage moth or whatever that's coming after your native plants like you would if you were planting something else. You don't need any fertilizer. You don't need any soil prep, nothing with native plants. And you don't have to give them as much supplemental water as well. Now, native plants, because of the deep-rooted thing more than anything else, but for some other reasons too, they're better able to filter pollutants. You might not have pollutants coming off of your roof. You might, if your roof is from before the 1970s. I just learned that from a workshop that WaterWise uh, did a couple weeks ago. Uh, but if it's coming off the, ro the road, is there going to be pollutants in there? Yeah, yep, definitely. Whether oil or from uh, your tires, uh, you're going to have pollutants coming in, of course. And then also we've got, um, you know, we can support local pollinators and wildlife. Is this an ecologically important area? Is it an ecologically interesting area? Yeah. What's the diversity of, of uh, pollinators in this area compared to anywhere else in the, in the country? It's higher. We have more pollinators here in southern Arizona than anywhere else in the United States. Anywhere. Now, in terms of all of our, wild, all of our wildlife, that includes animals, plants. Now, if we were to count them all up, what's, what's that number compared to elsewhere in the country, just in the United States? It's the third most. So the diversity here is incredible. So if we have, which means we have a, a lot of native plants to choose from, but that also means that if we plant native plants, we can then support the wildlife that already lives here as well, which is something I always try to do as well. Um, and then when properly placed around the yard, regionally appropriate plants can survive and actually even thrive on passive rainwater harvesting alone. So here's a place in Patagonia. This is someone's backyard. Um, and they're a bird watcher. And they're like, I want to have birds in my yard. That's my goal. So that's what we did with their yard, was we planted, uh, we harvested rainwater and uh, with the goal of planting plants for birds. Actually, that's a case study. So I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm going to hold on to that for later, but it's a teaser. So let's, uh, okay, once again, this is a, a drawing I stole from online. Um, consider the full size of the plants that you're planting as well. Oftentimes we get really excited and we're like, oh, I want to put 30 plants in here, but it's a place that maybe only two should grow. So think about the full size of the plants when you plant them out. Go visit a place where you can see a full grown tree or, or shrub or whatever beforehand as well. Um, Cause that's a really common error that I have been known to make still as well. We talked about this before with that arrow going back and forth, back and forth. Consider the water use of a plant. Who can help me identify what any of these plants are up here? Beth. Sycamore. Sycamore. Grandma. Grandma. 
Anyone know which grammar grass this is right here? Hairy grandma, this one, yeah, it almost looks like hairy grandma. It's a blue grandma, same thing. So this is a, it's a blue grandma. This is a sycamore. How about these two over here? Creosote. Yep. Anyone know what this one is here? It's a, El what's that? No, I don't. I'm not familiar with all the shrubs around This is an elderberry. So this is an elderberry. These are all native plants that live around here. Elderberry is native around here. Elderberry is native around here. <laughs> okay, so if we look at these plants, which of these is going to use the most water and which of these is going to use the least water? <laughs> most? Okay. Creosote. Least? Creosote. How about these two? Which is going to use more between these two? Elderberry and more. Perfect. Okay, so now we know how much these plants are going to use. We know where to put them and where not to put them in our system as well. Cool. Okay, so I know that you probably all want to read this, this chart here because it's so interesting, but I apologize. I'm going to instead send you to this website because this website is full of these guides that have these charts here. But I, I am going to just talk about what this chart shows, which is the flowering time. So um, when's, what, what months are usually the hottest and driest around here? May and June, those are the two. So May and June are a good time to have food out because there's not much else happening in the ecosystem at that time, right? So if we're looking for a tree or shrub to help support wildlife during that time, well, let's go to this chart here. We look at flower time, May, June. Oh, here's one, May, June, what is it? Oh, it's the choke cherry. So we could plant a native choke cherry. They live in Patagonia. They can live here 4,000 feet if they get enough moisture. Um, and then it's going to flower at the right time of year to support pollinators when maybe there's not as much other stuff flowering at that time of year. Or let's say you're a winter resident and you want to have things flowering when you're here. You can look through this chart and make sure that you've got things flowering when you're here too. Yeah. Is there a local garden shop that sells native plants, they like not a Home Depot, there's something where you go in and you buy a plant and you know it's going to survive because they bought it from, you know what I'm trying to say. For sure. So there's a few and I'm going to give you a few. One is ours. We have one in Patagonia. Borderlands Restoration Network has one. Go on our website borderlandsplants.org and uh, you can order things and have, pick them up. Um, we also have seeds that you can buy. Uh, in, in Hereford, there used to be Oaks of the Southwest. Is that still going on? Does anyone know? Okay, I see some heads nodding, so maybe not. The farmer's market. Does Petey Mesquite come? There's a couple people that come. See, there's the one off of 92, and it's like... Not by the farmer's market. Uh, it's it's like in Hereford area, but if you um, if you're heading towards the VN92 and then you take a right, so it's around by where there's that gift shop with the boat in front. Yeah. Um, the and the shop. Shop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and the one that it's advertised also is a koi because um, okay. they also sell koi that they have. Um, they sell that and stuff. Yeah. They're a little on the pricier side, but they're they're there. They're yeah. tucked yeah. back in secret. Yeah. Yeah, the Ace Harbor. Yeah, does anyone know their names? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's easy to find. Do you know what I'm talking about? That is Uh, I think so. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, if you head towards the mountain. What was that last year? And I heard. I heard someone say that the Ace Hardware in Sierra Vista also has some. So I'm going to share a couple other nurseries out of Tucson that also have some native plants. So there's two in particular out of Tucson that have a lot of native plants, and that's their specialty. One is Petey Mesquite's daughter has a spadefoot nursery. And that's spadefoot, just like the toad, spadefoot nursery. Tons of good information. They also are oftentimes featured on podcasts, so they're just a really great couple, those two. Um, the other one that is just fantastic out of Tucson is Desert Survivors. So that's Desert Survivors, 
and that's uh, Spadefoot Nursery out of Tucson, and then Borderlands Restoration Nursery. Those are probably the three biggest uh, suppliers of native plants in our area. However, if you go to like Savannah Nursery or Mesquite Valley Growers, one of the big box kind of nurseries where they don't specialize in native plants, you can find native plants there as well. To be honest, that's where I get my trees. I go to Mesquite Valley Growers if I want a native tree, or I go to Green Things, or I go to Savano. Because I also found it out the one that I was looking at, it's, um, it's Mountain View Koi, but I just also saw an article that in 2021, it closed its doors. Okay, well, yeah, so sorry about that. Moved to a different location. They're still around. Are they? I see the Galvet runs a place there all the time. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> On the listing, anyway, it says permanently closed, but that could just be at its location, that it's, mm -hmm. for, its former location. Yeah. I'm going to say that the harvesters um, revamp their website, and they have a lot of good information on what to plan and where to plan. Have you been on it by the way? I have. They put off their original site, but they have a lot of trees to plan, plants. The cooperative plants extension as well. Huh? I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, <laughs> the cooperative extension, also through the, the Master Gardening Program, we have a pretty um, at least in, in Jan Groff, but also through the Master Gardeners, there's a lot of resources in terms of what is what works well in our area. And we have a plant list, we're working on updating it, um, but it's available through WaterWise or and probably should be through the Master Gardeners as well. The Borderlands Nursery is open in May. I forget the dates. We have a, a monsoon plant sale coming right. up too. Yeah. So check our website too, borderlandsplants.org is the website for that one too. Um, all right, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so we've talked about native plants. Now let's talk about edible plants because we can do edible plants here. So how does the water get off of the road and into this garden here? Does anyone see how it gets there? You see that little hole right here? Okay, so this is great because, you know, you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't mess up the, um, the curb here, but what's the downside of using a little hole like this? It gets clogged with trash and leaves and all sorts of stuff too. So I, I don't use these, um, even though some city fo some folks would prefer it. Like ADOT would much prefer that. But um, no, instead I use the cut with a, you know, make it look like a trapezoid kind of thing, cut away. Okay, so edible plants. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, we can do edible plants. We can totally do edible plants in this type of situation. However, there's some things we need to think about if we're gonna be doing edible plants. You know, first and foremost, do we wanna be putting lettuces in that situation where maybe there's some kind of like oil coming off of the road? Okay, so not lettuces. What can we put in? Let's put in maybe a food forest. Let's put in trees or shrubs or, you know, small trees or, you know, vines. Because these perennial plants, um, you know, if you've got a, a, a veggie garden, let's say like the, the one in Wachuca City, the, the community garden, how often do you water those plants? Depends on the time of year. Uh, at the most, at the hottest months, we water a short time um, twice a day. Okay. Just because we've got new plants in there and we have to keep the water at the surface. Well, if it's May and June, is it going to rain twice a day? No, it's not going to rain twice a day. So if you've got a rain garden, maybe you want to put things in that are slightly more drought tolerant, like these perennial plants, something like a food tree, because most of these don't need to be watered every day. So that's the first thing I like to think about is, can I put a perennial plant in there, something like an apple tree or something like a fig, instead of maybe, you know, lettuces. Okay, let's go for the next one. And this kind of goes into what was just being talked about over here in terms of uh, Desert Harvesters. Desert Harvesters is a great group out of Tucson. Their whole thing is eating the desert. That's what they try to do. Um, and we are particularly fortunate here in this part of the world because there's so many wild native plants. This one's out of Glendale, so this is even you know, way, way lower even than Tucson. Um, the plants that we've got here are fantastic for food. You know, of course we don't have saguaros here, but you can eat saguaros, they're delicious. We do have this tree, we've got the mesquite, which has delicious pods that you can eat. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things too. So, uh, what's particularly great is we don't have to just plant apple trees, we can plant mesquite trees and eat those. We can plant um, 
prickly pears and eat those. We can plant uh, wolf berries and eat those and so on and so forth, uh, which is pretty cool as well. All right, let's go to the next one. However, if you are going to put in that apple tree, you've got to make sure that it's going to get water throughout the year. So here's a system that we've got in Patagonia. Uh, and this is something I want to do at the Wachuca City Community Garden too at some point. This is a system that is attached to the roof and the water at the youth center um, is then directed through an underground pipe and it pops up here and enters this basin, this basin, and there's a third basin here. So that way when it's raining, water moves into those basins and, and fills up those basins. They've been calculated using the calculations we used earlier today to be the right size. Um, however, if we're planting, and we've, then we've planted a bunch of non-native plants like uh, pineapple guava. We've planted blueberries, we've planted raspberries, we've planted blackberries, and we've planted kiwis. So these are all things, I'm not sure about the blueberries and kiwis, I'll let you know if those survive. I heard kiwi will do okay here. I've never seen anyone actually do it. I've heard about it, but I've never seen it. So I've got some cold hardy ones that come from like China or something. So I'll let you, people are also love them because uh, you can eat the skin. It's not hairy. It's not the hairy thing. Yeah. I'm excited to try them. We'll, we'll, I'll let you know. Um, Sorry, let's go back actually. No, it's all good. So what we've done here is, anyone know what we've got right here? What's this, this line right here? Anyone know? Irrigation. Yeah, irrigation. So here's an irrigation line because <laughs> This will not survive on passive rainwater alone. So what's really cool about this system is you can't see it, but there's also a cistern here that we've hooked up and connected to this system. So on one part of the building, the water comes straight into this, uh, we call it the berry patch. And then another part of the building, it goes and hits the cistern, goes into the cistern here. Then during May, June, and other really dry months, water then will come using gravity alone into the system here and water these plants as well. So this is going to be a totally rain-fed system based on two different uh, components, active rainwater harvesting and passive rainwater harvesting. Okay. Beth. On that real quick, where the, where the irrigation system is, that's a little trench. Yeah. Um, will that always be an open trench? No, it's close. It's with gravel and then... It's just co covered with earth. So all you see right now are these little irrigation things popping up. Exactly, and this is before we planted. This is after we planted, so you can see what it looks like now. Here's the emitter. Yeah, this is a, um, a blueberry that we covered with uh, rocks, so that way someone wouldn't come and eat them. <laughs> All right, so this place probably looks a little familiar. Here's our first case study. I'm gonna talk about three different rain gardens that we've done here. Um, and this one right here is, uh, we're going to go look at this afterwards too. So when I was working on this design with Anne and the rest of the community garden, we've got a ghost. Um, someone had a question, I think, over there. Uh, what happened was they diverted about two acres of impervious surface. That's roof water where we're sitting right here. The places that we parked, this parking area, all that used to flood in front of the library. So when you're walking into the library, you have this you know, big pool of water to have to deal with. So what did the town do? They put in this system that directed the water instead right into the community garden, which Ann and I were first like, oh, this could be really great because uh, you know, we've got all this water next to the community garden. However, that water was flowing right into where the raised basins, raised garden beds are over here, which could uh, affect their stability over time. So this actually was a hazard. This was a hazard that we found out about actually just as we were starting to construct the garden. So this was a nice little surprise that um, was going to actually threaten our ability to grow food here. So instead of allowing that to happen, we then proposed a different solution uh, to the town of Wachuca City. And here's the after right here. Uh, and this took three months. Is that how long we worked on this? Five, five months. Five months? Five. <laughs> so we had we had uh we did this project here and instead of talking about it let's just watch this video so i'm just gonna come over here and do something real quick
Water basins at the Huachuca City Community Garden are designed to manage rainwater runoff that would cause erosion and damage the garden. During the summer of 2020, machines and hundreds of hours of volunteer manpower moved tons of rock and dirt to build a rainwater drainage and collection system to manage 60,000 gallons of water per one inch of rain. The basins are a series of rock-lined pools that collect the rainwater and runoff. PVC pipe channel the water under our walkway as the water travels north. Runoff flooding is successfully mitigated as the water flows from basin to basin, watering plants and eventually soaking into the ground. So this is, there's 14 basins there, and uh, they have the capacity of 30,000 gallons of water, which is a lot of water. We were talking before about, you know, that, that roof line created, what, 1,800 gallons of water? So 30,000 gallons of water, how, how much rain does it take to fill up these basins? Half an inch. Half an inch. And we talked about sometimes there's three inches of rain that we get here. So this is not sufficient for the amount of water that we get. So we'll talk about where that water is going to go in a little bit. Uh, let's go skip that one too. And as a result, we planted over 100 native plants here too. I haven't taken any recent photos, but here's one from, I think that's summer, 2020. And there's just uh, tons of native plants that are growing in here as well. And that was the goal. We wanted to harvest that water, get it to sink in the ground, put some native plants here. And why would we want to put native plants next to a, a garden? Like, what were we thinking doing that? Pollinators. The pollinators. Most of the food that we are going to grow in a, in a garden needs to be pollinated. Uh, if we don't have a lot of bees around, like a, you know, an apiary or something like that, we attract them with native plants. We attract ones that are drought adapted. Uh, so that was the whole goal here was to increase the amount of pollinators because if we increase the amount of pollinators in our garden, what does that result uh, have on our garden. We have more fruits that pollinated and therefore we have better uh, production. You can increase the yield significantly by just planting native plants um, around your garden. Uh, there's a story of, uh, before we get here, um, there's a story of uh, folks doing this in uh, California. They take out a third of the trees uh, the third of the almond trees in California, and they plant those with the native pollinator attracting plants. They were, take away a third of the, the food producing plants, and what happens is an increase, a net increase in the amount of yields. Um, you guys are from California, so you probably have firsthand knowledge of this. Uh, so that's, that's something that's significant. The same of with the same amount of, yeah, with the same amount of water. So having, having, um, Native plants next to food production areas increases your yield significantly. The other thing is from, we have this on the west side of the garden as well. Um, we planted trees, we planted shrubs, we planted little, little forbs like this. What's the impact gonna be during the really windy times of year in that location? It's a windbreak too. So once again, we're stacking functions on top of each other, trying to do as much shade. Um, as well, and it's really beautiful as you walk in as well. People are usually pretty intrigued by this location. And you wouldn't believe the number of native bees we get. It's unbelievable that we, the level of them that we're getting in the garden as a result of this. Do you have hives out? No, these, these are native bees, they don't make hives. Um, they just lay eggs yeah. in spaces. Solitary wow. bees. And so they are not subject, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is the native bees are not decreasing in number from disease or whatever is causing the hive bees to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we want to really strengthen our pollination capability by encouraging native bees to come into our garden. And they don't sting you either, so 
You can work with them. You can pick vegetables. It's not a challenge. So let's go to the next slide. One of the coolest thing about this project was the amount of collaboration that happened. Uh, this is not something that Borderlands could have done on its own. This is not something the Garden could have done on its own. And it's certainly not something the town of Huachuca City could have done on its own. Um, how, many, how many soldiers from Fort Huachuca came and helped out with this project? Well, the first day, 15 people showed up, 15 soldiers. And we stayed pretty much at that level for quite a while until the work decreased and then the real hardcore ones, like the one sitting here, <laughs> continued through the whole project and still comes to the garden to work with us. So we still have volunteers coming from the Army all the time. What's happening in this photo here? This is an award ceremony uh, in the hangar of the, the young men and women who came to work with us teach uh, UAV piloting. They came. Uh, every time and we wanted the city uh, wanted to reward them for that service and so this is an award ceremony in the hangar where they actually work on post and this is the group standing there some of them are missing there like their captain their commander during this period of time was moved to texas and we saw her a couple of times in there captain piper newman so she didn't get an award in this ceremony she got one by mail and so that's what this was, is a formal award ceremony. Right, let's go to the next slide. So that was a great project. Um, here's one in Patagonia, too. And this one started way, way long ago, 2014. And uh, this is basically what it started with. Water would come off of the roofs, come off of the roof of that building over there, and it'd come into this drain. It'd go underneath the pathway and then into an infiltration basin where it was covered with plastic, so nothing infiltrated, and it just went into the football field. So this was what um, it was, and let's go to the next slide. So then this is what the kids designed. Uh, the kids from the school designed this and then came and built this after school as well. Water comes off of the roof from the middle school science building, goes into the first basin here, then it fills up and goes into the next basin, into the third basin, and then into this fourth basin before going over the, this little rock wall and then into the, uh, the drain right here. What you'll notice, oh, you're good. Um, what you'll notice is on that far side, there is also a little uh, basin here, a little kind of area where water was pooling in that image. We eventually dug that out and turned it into a, a, a pond and filled that pond with water that falls into the cistern right here. So then what we did was we planted that area, we planted it with all native plants. You can see we put in a lot of native plants. We put in this little, uh, observation deck that's built over that, um, that uh, drain right there so that kids can look over into this pond. And then we built some uh, uh, benches so it could be an outdoor classroom. Teachers could bring their kids out, sit down. They could stand on the little podium there and uh, give lectures. Or kids could come out for lunch because kids usually eat lunch outside at the school. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is 2020. You can see plants are growing. We had to trim that mesquite a few times. Go to the next slide. And this is it last year. You can't even see the benches anymore. Um, the plants grew fast. So if you harvest rainwater, you can grow a lot of stuff real quick. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is a home design in Patagonia. And this is that guy who I was talking about before who was all about birds. He moved to Patagonia to look at birds. That was his reason to move to Patagonia. He wanted to, in his new house, he wanted to uh, attract the birds as well. That was his goal. So we don't need to know everything in this drawing. What you do need to know is that the dotted line is the outside of the building. It goes up here as well. And then this is the fence line around the yard. Bless you. That's all you need to know in this drawing. Let's go to the next drawing. Let's go to the next slide. So the next slide right here, what we've got is the rainwater harvesting plan. And what you can see is there's a series of basins. So once again, same thing that we did here in Huachuca City, have water going to one basin, then the next basin, the next basin. And uh, what happened was not a single drop of water in this last year where it rained so much, not a single drop left his property. And instead, all that water sunk into the ground and supported plants. So let's look at what that looks like on the ground um, at, at his house. So water comes off of the roof, it goes down these scuppers, and then it goes into these basins. I'll show you how it happens in a sec. 
Um, same thing that we've got in, in Huachuca City. Grasses are the things that you plant at the ba bottom of the basins. And then around the basins, you can sort of see some uh, green things growing here. You've got some plants growing around the edges as well that can't get inundated with water. So how does water get under the pathway? First, it goes into the small little catchment basin, and then it goes into a pipe that goes underneath the pathway and into the larger basin over here. Um, and then this is it after uh, one year, two years, two summers of monsoon rains. No, one summer of monsoon rains. This is what's, what it looks like after one summer of monsoon rains. Um, eventually, it's going to look like the school. Uh, eight years from now, it's going to look like the school where it's just growing uh, quite a bit as well. Um, yep, another basin right here. In between the basins, we planted these uh, milkweeds, just like what we did here in Wichuca City, too. More basins. My phone is full of photos of basins. <laughs> that is a nice <laughs> And uh, this is the one that the Havelina absolutely love. This is the primrose. They've got that gate that goes around, or the fence that goes around the side of their yard, which is a great thing if you want to plant these. Um, okay, so I think this is it for this discussion. Um, once again, I hope you feel like empowered. I hope you feel like you have a little bit of background knowledge, at least to get yourself dangerous in terms of starting your own uh, rain garden on your property here. Um, I wanted to just give one further plug for Brad Lancaster's books. If you buy it online from his website here, uh, you get a $10 discount too, and he signs it. <coughs> if you want to buy both of them together, you get a $15 discount. Um, or $25, sorry. Did you ever happen to know what happened with Volume 3? He was going to be doing Cisterns, Volume 3, the Cisterns for years, and nothing has happened. So what he did, instead of a Volume 3, is a Volume 2 of this, and then a Volume 3 of this. So now we've got a third edition of this, and he's got a second edition of uh, this one. So he's going to get there, but he wants to perfect these first. So he's getting there. Does he have time? We're all eagerly waiting, right? There are good cistern books too, but I'm excited for his because you know it's going to be perfect for this location. Um, any questions before we go outside and take a look at uh, the, cist the, the basins here? Cool. Well, let's take like five minutes or so, use the restrooms, and then we'll go outside and take a look at those, those basins. So our first stop is actually going to be the library. And why do you think the library is our first stop on this tour? This is where it used to get flooded. So all the water from this, uh, this area used to come down. And where did it stop? It stopped right here at the entrance. <clears throat> so you can see where they installed this grate right here. And the water now goes into this grate system. And if you follow where the freshly cut uh, piece of asphalt is, you can see the direction of where the pipe is. So let's go follow this um, area and see where the outlet is. <clears throat> so guys, let's come around this side. So let's come around on this side over here. So we're going to just come around this side over here and take a look at this, uh, this pipe. So right here, my shadow's pointing at this pipe. And this pipe here is where all that water comes from. For this two acre catchment area, this is where it comes out of. And originally what they did was they just built this rock lined swale that ended just at this corner right here. And this is where it stopped. Uh, so then this is where, um, you know, all of those entities, Borderlands, the town of Huachuca City, the library, uh, the community garden, and then Fort Huachuca, all came together to then build the basins over here. So we can then either come around this side or come around this side and look at the basins over here. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you can see the path of the water just based on how the land is shaped here. Uh, but Ian, maybe you could tell us how quickly the water infiltrates in after it's pooling here. Does it stick around for a while? Not very long, uh, just a few hours. 
so we don't have to worry about mosquitoes or anything. This is very porous soil because it's got so much rock, I think, is probably the reason. Yeah. It, rock goes way down. Uh, James can tell you how much rock is here because he dug a lot of it up. Yeah. It's very rocky because this is the slope down to the Baba Kamari, which is one of the major tributaries, used to be one of the major tributaries to the San Pedro. And so this is all going down there and all these rocks, I'm assuming, came ultimately from the mountains up here uh, in runoff. And they're quite nice. You can tell they've been tumbled. They're very nice rocks. So there's a question about this being lined. Right. And this oh, is sorry, I didn't the question. Yeah, this is lined with uh, with landscape cloth. And okay. and that's to reduce the amount of weeds. And you can see how effective that is, which is right. sort of effective. Well, but what would this place look like without that weed cloth? Well, it would look like this. Right. So it's uh it did a, it was slightly effective. But what we planted were, were each one of these little pink flags is, that's a plant that we put in. So here's an ash tree. Over here, we've got a clematis vine. The, there's another clematis vine right here. We've got some grasses, we've got some more plants. So as we walk down, look at all the plants that we put in. And uh, these vines, yeah, and, and the reason we put these native clematis in is to then climb up these, this fence because, you know, a day like today where it's windy, the wind's coming from the southwest, it's going to reduce the impact of the wind on the plants that we have in the garden. Any questions so far? Yeah. How long would it take them to up on the fence? Well, we planted these two years, ago. two years ago, and at this point they're pretty healthy. When we put them in, they were not very big. So with this monsoon rain, I'm guessing we're going to have them growing up the, this area in the monsoons. So probably about two, two full monsoons is what it'll take for them to start growing up. Yeah, they're, they're doing pretty well over here. All right, so let's move down this area. And if you've got questions about what plants are or any of that stuff, we can stop and talk about them. Oh, this one's doing now, great. We didn't plant all these. Some of them just the ground, like the ground cover here just started on its own. Yeah, this is a native plant that just popped up on its own. Okay. This is a, a stragolus or, or moon seed um, that just grows natively around here. Yeah, there's a bunch of native plants. That's going to be a great ground cover. Yeah. Stop the erosion. We're pretty fortunate because this location actually has a lot of native plants, even the grasses that are grown around here. Right. Well, there is Bermuda grass, there's a bunch of native bunch grasses here too. So that's great. Some of the native plants that we planted have seeded in here as well. So here's the uh, native fuchsia, or the uh, hummingbird trumpet, is that what this is? which came from here. This is probably the mama right here, and some seeds came over here and over there as well, which is great. We planted this big bunch grass over here. This one's a uh, sacatone grass over here. There's one over in front of Beth here too. They get pretty tall. They get six, seven feet tall, and they get about that wide as well. So these will be nice and big too. This is another ash tree. This is the native ash, the uh, velvet ash or Arizona ash. It sure looks good. When we planted it, it was kind of stumpy. Uh, we planted two ash and we planted two uh, walnuts as well. There's one walnut there and then one over here walnut. as well. Yeah. Are okay down here? They do. There's an Arizona walnut. Oh, Arizona. Okay. Arizona black walnut. Um, and, and the only just... protection was the little gray. That's it. Actually, you know, galas means walnut. A little different here, I think. I'm sorry. Well, galas means walnut in Spanish. Oh, really? Wow, I did not know that. And we didn't put any fruit plants here because we didn't want to attract wildlife here outside of the fence line as well. Hey, look, we have blooms on this clematis or buds. All right, it's starting to flower. I think that's what we start. And this is great because we want them flowering right now. This is a good time to have things flowering because once again, there's not much flowering out in, in the natural world. As, aside from like this, the moon seed over there, the astragalus, uh, and then these non-native um, uh, London rockets that I see around here too, the mustards. We had to reinforce it a couple times. I was just thinking the amount of water, it never rises higher than the banks. 
it always keeps going. Yeah, because we uh, the size we wanted four inches higher than the overflow. And that's something I didn't mention. So there's a really good question. Does the water ever breach the banks? And when we first built these, yes, it did. But because of number eight, we had to come back and reassess and we rebuilt some of the sides to be a little bit higher. There's that video of us trying to like lift that thing up and that was soil to try to pack up the edges here to make it a little bit higher. But now we've got a four inch drop, a four inch drop between the, the rim of the bathtub and the overflow. And that's what you want. You want a four inch drop with the overflow, which is not something I mentioned in the class there. This is a penstemon. This is a penstemon that Beth, who's over here. Yeah, they're native. Yeah, penstemon? They're penstemon. This is the Perry's penstemon. And penstemon, they love dry areas. So this is a good location for it. Here's a milkweed. Here's a milkweed that's flowering right here as well. And this is something that we planted and now they're they're spreading as well. Looks so much different than the milkweed I'm used to from Kentucky to come here. Totally different. Well, here in Arizona, we've, we've got 20 species of milkweed. So this one right here is Arizona milkweed, but there's 19 other species of milkweeds that live around here too. There's still some standards of monitors. Do you get monarchs through here? This is actually one of the important mi migrations. So the question was, do we get monarchs through here? Yes, we get monarchs. This is one of the important migration corridors for monarchs as they head south to Mexico. Actually, monarchs that come here over winter in three locations, and it's the only place that happens. So yeah. we need to have milkweed here. And I just didn't know that. We had some in Pierce like that, but I just didn't know they were milkweed. Yeah. Okay. So I love these. Come grab the seeds sometime. Yeah. And harvest them or put them at your property as oh, well. Oh, definitely. So we've got more native plants. This is the Arizona yellow bells, Tacoma stands. We've got the walnut here in front of Ann. We've got another Tacoma stands, the... Arizona yellow bells over here. They die back in the winter times. So this is totally normal. But look at this. It's looking great. Looks a little better. Look at all that new growth on it. Got, it's, on there too. it's flowering just back there. Oh, okay. Good. You can see how high it was when we planted it. It was about this tall when we planted it. Two years later, it's this tall. Stick, yeah. <laughs> it's getting so starch in its background. <laughs> I bet. Now is that natural rootstock or is it a different rootstock core? Uh, this is the native plant that we did a cutting of. Okay. So it's it's native rootstock. We didn't have oh, to... Oh wow, okay. This is a, a native tree that uh, just grows. So in Patagonia, this is a tree that grows in our, our central park and then also along the river as well. It lives in both locations. And they produce the black walnut. They produce black walnuts, which is edible. Yeah. But you've got to work hard to get those right. food out of there. Yeah. You rooted the cutting, or did you you grafted it? We rooted it. Wow. Yeah, yeah we rooted That's it. Pretty good. You can also grow them from seed, but it takes longer if you try to grow them from seed. Right. But if you dip them in rooting hormone, or you know the yes. the salix, the walnut, uh, the Actually, willow, yeah. Yeah. you can get them to grow <laughs> just fine. Wow. If you grab cuttings, you know, just I've don't grab them from this one, please. <laughs> <laughs> so then in this so no food plants out here so the question was do we have pomegranate there's no food plants out here because we don't want to attract wildlife here we want food plants inside the fence <clears throat> so we'll show you what we did in there in just a minute too because we did some rainwater harvesting in here for for pomegranates and figs and stuff water then comes into these three basins it eventually goes underneath Alex's feet into the next basins over here. And then around the corner past that elderberry, you can see what an elderberry looks like over there. It's flowering and into the final basin. <clears throat> In Veterans Park, that's where we're gonna harvest the rest of the rainwater. So we talked about a half inch of rain is harvested in this area. So in a peak event, <clears throat> anything more than a half inch of rain is going into the park. We're planting 40 more trees in the park with the rain that comes out of here and the rain that comes out or the water that comes out of that tower over there too. So in the future, we're gonna have a big park over there as well. So Anne, can we go in and look at the French drain over here? Yes. They're our best crop. <laughs> All right, so next we're gonna look over here. So let's come on over here.
All right, so where I'm standing, this is the site of a future orchard. So where are we harvesting the rainwater for this orchard? I see people pointing over there. It's actually underneath my feet. So this right here is a French drain and water that comes down off of the uh, skate park comes across the street, comes uh, down where those, uh, that utility gate is, and then it sinks in right here underneath my feet. Now, Ann, how big are the, the basins that were dug right here? Um, just the gallon capacity of the two basins was 8,000 gallons. 8,000 gallons. But then we have rock in there, of course, because it's a French drain. So what is that, about 3,000 gallons that you would yeah. be usable space for water? So from you to me, this is one basin that goes from about here to about here. And all the way back to here. That's one basin. There's a second one back behind me as well. So the reason why we did this is because people can now walk on this space. Unlike over there, where you can't walk on that space. We're going to then plant a bunch of trees right here uh, as soon as the next part of the fence line is put in to separate the production part of the garden from the teaching and discovery part of the garden over there. And uh, what we did was we dug down, what, three? Three to four feet. Three to four feet deep. We backfilled that with leech rock, which is about two inches uh, in diameter. We then put on top of that some weed cloth. The weed cloth. Weed cloth allows water to go through, but it doesn't allow dirt to go through. So water comes through, water goes down, dirt stays up here, which means the pore space, the space between all of those different rocks that are underneath my feet, instead of that filling with dirt, it fills up with what? With water instead. So that water then slowly sinks into the ground underneath our feet, which then can be used up by different trees that are here before going down through that little swale that we've got here into the basins that swales right at the edge of the garden, right at the edge of the concrete blocks here. And we have connection drains going between the two basins yeah. right across here. So we've got drains, we've got pipes that go between the two basins so that way it doesn't have to f overflow and go into the next one. It all happens beneath our feet. So Anne, right after the basins were dug, well, something happened here, what happened? Well. The evening after they were dug, in fact, the poor man who was digging these basins from the city uh, was working his buns off to get these completed because we got the biggest rain of last summer after, right after he finished digging these. And he was afraid he wasn't going to get done, and so he was racing to do that. Completely filled these basins. 8,000 gallons of water. So that tells you what would have gone back there. Because we didn't have this berm here yet. The soldiers built this berm after these were all completed and the and the dirt and I mean the rocks and gravel were put in here. Then they put this berm in. So that saved our garden. <laughs> Basically saved it. So we've got a ton of water that comes through. We're using as much as we can. There's a lot more opportunity to harvest water here. Um, I just wanted to show one more thing before we go, and that's the cistern. The cistern over here, if you turn around and look at it, it's got a capacity of 2,500 gallons. So now you can visualize what 8,000 gallons looks like. It's a little bit more than three times that size that sits in right here. About that much fills up these basins now, now that we've put the rock back in. Uh, but that shows you how much water comes here. So we talked about the overflow before. What's the overflow doing over there right now? Can you all see it? Can you see the overflow through there? Yeah, let's go take a look. So let's go walk over to that cistern and take a quick look and then, then we'll say goodbye after that. Okay, so now we're looking at this overflow. Guys, where does the overflow go when the cistern fills up? It goes behind me and then eventually on out. So is, are we maximizing the potential of the overflow with the system right now? I see people uh, shaking their heads no. I agree, right now we're not using this as best as we can. 
So this is something that's going to be a future project. Any ideas of what we could do here? Any thoughts come to mind after talking about this stuff? Well, we can have a lot more native plants. Could put some native plants here. We're inside the fence, so we could do some maybe edible plants here too. We've got some uh, nice native plants already in terms of the mesquite. And anyone know what this tree is? Desert willow tree too, yep. What I'm hoping to try to convince Anne of doing is putting in a little berry patch right here. That's what I want to do. Put in some, uh, some basins here, maybe collect the, or connect the basins to uh, an irrigation system that's attached to the cistern. So that way water's coming up into here from either the overflow or from the cistern itself. That's my goal with, uh, with this into the future. But first I have to convince Anne, and then I've got to uh, write the grant to do it afterwards. So it's a future project. No convincing here. <laughs> Are the cinder blocks effective at directing the, the, the water on the surface? Yes, they direct it and maintain it in there. We don't have really have any leakage. We put uh, cinder block along the fence line there too because in a really heavy rain, we'll have a river coming down the surface road. And so we don't want it coming over this way. It will come down this uh, entrance down there where we have the, the French drains. And that's fine because it'll go in there and, and so add water to and that. And it doesn't wash out along the, no. the ridge? No. Nope. We had that huge rain and it did not do that. No. Okay, guys, thank you so much for coming. Do you have any questions? Did you have to dig the cinder blocks down any? Or no. are they just on the surface? Yep, just on the surface? Yep. And we, you will, we had them over there too before we had the French drain. And when we got a heavy rain, Sheila got great video. It was almost to the top of those cinder blocks and they were keeping all the water out of there. So cinder blocks were great if in an emergency. But if you want to be able to direct it in different ways, and you can, you could direct it that way, but it's not very safe. Yeah. It's better last. to it's better to have different ways of doing. And they last forever. They, they do last. <laughs> they do you last. You can't build wooden uh, raised beds here. They just won't last. That's right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for coming, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.